Good evening, everybody. My name is Lisa Campbell. I'm the director of the Barry Center for the Arts at Ramapo College of New Jersey. We're going to go ahead and get started with our Q&A. We're delighted you're here with us this evening to have a conversation with the co-directors of this project, Days of Atonement. I have with me this evening Shalom Gorowitz, who is on the faculty at Ramapo College. As you know, this has been a month-long program of our faculty film series, and we're delighted to be here with Shalom and grateful that he gave us the opportunity to view the film. Um, he is joined by his co-director, Daryl Rudy, and we welcome Daryl to this conversation as well. And I want to start off just by making a really interesting connection as I got an opportunity to talk to them ahead of time. You two went to school together, uh, but this is the first time that you've worked together on a project. And so I, I just was really curious, how did this come about? How did that opportunity come about? Shalom, do you want to start out and um, tell us a little bit about that? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, we were uh, at the first year at uh, California Institute of the Arts. Um, he was in theater and I was in media art. And, uh, you know, we probably were at parties and there was a pool there that, you know, we all would swim in. And, so, uh, but you know, it wasn't until 50 years later about that uh, we met Daryl and his wife uh, were in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, and they were had a visionary idea to start a bakery uh, to train uh, people who had just been released from prison um, as bakers. So we met through that and you know, slowly we realized the uh, Cal Arts connection. Um, yeah, and then the friendship started to develop. That's great. Uh, you remember it, Daryl? Yes, very, very uh, vividly. And by the way, that pool was loaded with people. And in those days, you didn't wear bathing suits, <laughs> especially at Cal Arts. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. Shalom covered it beautifully. Um, we've developed a personal friendship uh, that, you know, really is quite lovely. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's how it all started 50 or more years ago. So, gentlemen, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about where you got the idea for this storyline. And what do you want audiences to take away from this story? Daryl, I'll toss it to you to get us started on that you're asking me to yeah mm -hmm. well i i think this uh, guy uh, that i'm looking at to my right was more behind all of that than i was uh from the visionary standpoint and then once we talked then it got a little more flat and we were both uh engaged but but really i would credit shalom for the um initial vision and um, I think uh, along with that uh, it was magnificent how well we worked together I mean we just worked beautifully together and uh, just did everything organically. That's great. Shalom what do you want audiences to get from this work? Um, okay well it's just you know I think everyone who uh, saw the film agrees that Daryl is really a brilliant actor and you know, he carried it and he carried, you know, almost everyone else, even Annette Fox, who's a professional uh, actor, you know, credits him for, you know, the way his generosity is as an actor and his awareness. So uh, it's, um, I think it was uh, kind of, yeah, like Daryl says, it, uh, well, it was the pandemic, and uh, Vermont was uh, credited as being uh, one of the uh, most, uh, it, it had been the most cautious, and it had great tracing and all the other things in place very quickly, a Republican governor, but who trusted science. So uh, we didn't feel quite as threatened uh, working as a group in an ensemble in Vermont, as we might have if we were in New York or New Jersey. So um, that's, so, you know, basically, uh, my wife, Rachel, and his wife, Barbara, are good friends. And 
so we were taking lots of walks together. And we were hanging out on his porch or in my backyard. And, uh, you know, I think this is maybe what guys do in creative uh, guys, you know, want to do a project or, you know, let's make a movie. Uh, so it was kind of like, okay, Daryl has this long background with uh, prisoners and people in prison while they're in prison and people after they've been released. And he knows that world for Sam. Um, so, you know, it was the original idea of somehow casting him in some way in relationship to that uh, part of the local population where he knew a lot of uh, people who were like eager to perform. And, um, you know, so yeah, like he said, it grew organically, you know, out of just hanging out uh, as much as, you know, we felt comfortable again during the pandemic. It wasn't like every day, but, uh, you know, maybe once a week or so. So, Not, by the way, none of the lines were ever predetermined. Everything was happening as it happened in the moment. So I think that's a mean, crucial piece of why we worked so well together from our perspective, at least. The very yeah. improvisational. You oh, know. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I think what I was hoping people would get out of it, which Daryl mm -hmm. really like pulled off without much direction or hardly any direction, was someone who was like really uh, had lived a tough life, had just gone through like his whole life behind bars. And he was like totally committed in every part of him to make amends. And he knew he was going to be die, he was going to die soon. And, you know, he's, that was, he stuck with that, you know. So for me, it's about redemption, you know, something about redemption and the possibility that it's always possible uh, to be redeemed. And, uh, and that's, that's what I'm hoping people, you know, get that, uh, have that through his experience, the experience he's providing us. So what is your experience um, in your understanding of how are former inmates received in the community when they're released and, and this whole idea of you know, along the storyline of having this redemption, but then this sort of interesting, you know, situation to have, you know, to commit a crime again or to justify, you know, committing a crime to repay a debt. Tell us a little bit about the thought process there and what your knowledge is of, of that prison community. Are you asking me or yeah, who, whoever both of us? Jump in. Yeah. Um, well, I have a fairly good understanding of that uh, based on work I did as a young person working in the inner city, working with uh, in the ghetto, in the edge of the ghetto, and um, just knowing naturally, having been raised there, how to operate in that world. So for me, um, I think uh, to answer part of your question, it's it's not an easy life, A, and B, um, the level of recidivism, at least even here in um, uh, our state of Vermont, which is a pretty progressive state, is uh, somewhere around 60%. Mm. So that's a lot. That means if uh, for every two that go into prison, one goes back maybe three, four times in his or her life. So it's, uh, there's a lot to be changed in the system, but we won't go there. So uh, that to me is, was just very, very natural thing to do. Uh, so playing that role was kind of easy. Uh, that's the wrong word. It was just kind of, there it was. Nothing to, we just did it together organically, so. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, that's earlier. great. I think just to have some insight. Um, yeah. I, I'd like to shift just a little bit and sort of talk about the technical aspect of the film a little bit and tell us about um, how you shot the film. And, um, and, and you've alluded, Shalom, to obviously doing this during COVID. And so how did you adapt to even being able to make a film in, in COVID time and, 
you know, protect everybody. Well, nobody that was involved uh, got sick from COVID. Good. Uh, so I think, you know, whatever we did, but as I said before, a lot of it is to the credit of the people of Vermont who put the masks on, you know, early and consistently. And um, a lot of people, our neighbors in Vermont say, we were born for this. We're, we love hunkering down. That's what we're, we have a master's degree in hunkering down. So, you know, it was kind of, uh, Know, we were in a place where, okay, but nevertheless, um, I was shooting mostly uh, always with the uh, iPhone, the iPhone 11 Pro model. And sometimes I had it connected to um, something called a gimbal, which had another small, like sort of floating uh, camera on it. So I could see what the gimbal was showing. And then, you know, the gimbal is like a miniature steady cam. It's literally that small. And uh, the, the camera part is about that small. And so it's, it's totally steady. So I was able to be at a fairly long distance from him and keep it in focus and move along with him and kind of uh, keep. And, you know, when the camera was steady, it stays steady. When it's moving, you don't, you know, feel like it, uh, you feel like it's on a crane or something. It's a lot more expensive uh, to do. So, I mean, it was a one person crew, me, and, uh, you know, we did the best we could. If, uh, we only did basically one take of each shot. So, um, we did shoot a lot of material, and a lot of it was left on the cutting room uh, floor, as they said. But um, everything we didn't do like a sec. Do that again? No, we never did. That. And uh, we tried to keep distance. You can see, like in the scene with Mark and Justin, that they're kind of, you know, unnaturally distanced from each other. You know, there was just sort of this consciousness. That before the pandemic, they would have been a pretty tight group, probably. But uh, during the pandemic, they just sort of naturally, and occasionally there, there is some intimacy, but you know. Uh, and, and tell us about the process to cast the film. How did you go about finding the people to, to be in this? Um, well, let's just start with that. Just tell us a little bit about how you approach that. I'm not sure who, what your roles were between you and in, in that process. Daryl had, you know, every time he said, oh, I can get someone to do da 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 da, he'll do anything, da 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 da, I would say, really? <laughs> and then, you know, Mark or someone who's like a natural actor would appear and do like a couple of amazing scenes uh, together without any rehearsal or, you know, just by, giving him the improvisational uh, uh, prompting or triggering. You know, he was just able to get into him, himself as a character with this twist, this improvisational twist. So, uh, but Daryl was really, uh, he made, I think, all, except for Annette as a friend of mine in New York, I think you made all of the other connections. Well, Tamar, uh, as a little aside, the gun guy lived right across the street from me. Great guy. Wonderfully wild and, and great guy. And we got to see the house we lived in. <laughs> That's not, you know, I, I trained as an actor when I was young. It's not easy to improvise like that, though. That, that takes a real skill to be able to do that and, you know, and make it look natural. Um, mm -hmm. So that's yeah, a, a yeah all the people were uh, they they were pretty amazing and and doing just as uh, Shalom had said that you know they just stepped in did it we like you said didn't do takes like they do in regular movies and came out there they were and I thought they did a amazingly good jobs great and very okay. intimate shots as well very very close up shots yeah I mean to be specific the um, 
everyone is themselves and mm -hmm. but with one added fictional element so rachel is herself you know, a lovely woman and living in vermont but she has a fictional brother who daryl's character killed so <clears throat> everyone that we work with you know we're are comfortable kind of in being themselves and then adding this other element to it. It's, um, you know, it's a pretty tried and true uh, improvisational technique. And then setting up a conflict between people in each scene. So Daryl needed a place to stay. Mark wasn't going to be able to do that. So they had the whole back and forth that they had was based on just that that Mark was going to resist no matter how much, you know, he felt bad for, for Daryl. So each scene has some kind of uh, conflict like that. That's great. Um, at this point, I would love to invite Joey Perez to join us. Um, Joey, can you? Hello. He is. Welcome. Joey is um, an alum of Ramapo College and worked on this project and um, I promise you folks, we're going to get to your questions very soon now. I just thought it would be nice to, um, to bring you in. So if anybody wanted to ask you a question as well, but um, Joey, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you learned um, working on this project? Um, I don't, and if any of it speaks to hopefully what we taught you at Ramapo. Sure. Um, um, so as uh, a visual arts student in uh, a electronic art and animation concentration, uh, the major mostly dives into 3D animation uh, using mostly Cinema 4D. And mostly due to just not having access to that software after graduation, um, it forced me to kind of teach myself how to do 3D animation in uh, After Effects which I was able to learn After Effects in uh, a motion graphics class uh, at Ramapo, which if there's any students that are here that are watching this, that are animation students, I highly recommend the motion graphics class because it taught me a lot of skills, uh, a lot of fundamental skills I'm able to apply to really everything that I do now. Um, but yeah, I uh, was able to kind of experiment with the art style and create something that was really unique that I had never really attempted before. So. That's great. Well, um, Shalom, can you explain for our audience a little bit about bringing Joey into the project and what his role was specifically? Okay. Well, um, I just want to, you know, do a shout out to uh, our provosts and uh, quite a few other uh, colleagues and other people who were involved in the film, uh, who I think Susan Gaudin was there, I probably is still there. So I, I we really appreciate uh, your tuning into this. Um, well, Joey, I could say he's the average Ramapo student, but he was really like an extraordinary student. And um, in the first class, uh, like four, in, maybe in his freshman year, in the second year, uh, I was going around you know, meeting the students and I met him and I said, he's the assistant teacher. And, you know, if you have problems, go to Joey. So uh, then we came up with a project that um, first we thought we could try to do a very ambitious 3D uh, film, but it, it turned into a book that's being published right now uh, that he and another student did uh, illustrations for. Um, sort of an African myth story. And we actually went to Ghana together, uh, Joy and I, with a bunch of other people, uh, where we did like firsthand research. So you know, I thought, oh, you know, we work so well together. We worked together like for four years, um, you know, very quickly transcended this uh, student teacher, or I should say he became my teacher, which I'm very grateful for in many ways and uh, as so many of the students are. But uh, so, you know, he was you know, really nice about uh, 
donating his time and his talents to, to the project. That's great. I'm going to invite my colleague Ed Eloy to come in now. He is going to bring us. I can see there's a lot of questions that have been coming in. Um, and while Edward joins us, um, I would just say if you still have questions that you would like to ask any of my guests, you can type those into the Q&A function of your Zoom, not the chat function, but the Q&A function. So Ed, tell us some of these great questions that you're getting from the audience. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just would like to let the participants know that if you don't hear your specific question, it's because it's been answered already throughout the conversation. Uh, I have one question here from Laurel. Uh, the question is, how did you find the locations Uh oh, the downfall of technology. Here we go. I'm going to step in. Ed, how did you find the locations you used in chapter one? Okay. Yes. Um, well, uh, okay. Well, St. Johnsbury, you know, uh, used to be a very thriving industrial uh, city in, in Vermont. And it's, you know, really a diminished version of, of what it had been. And uh, so, um, you know, we started, there's, these, there are a lot of trains there, as you can see. So there's sort of train motif, you know, in uh, crime films or in, uh, prison films, like the Pulse and Prison Blues and other things, you know, I thought, him coming out of the trains was like coming out of the uh, prison itself. You know, he just sort of appears. And then he walks through kind of the downtown, more, let's say, seedy side, where you could just see, you know, what was there and what isn't there anymore, basically. It's really kind of deserted. And, uh, but it used to be full of, you know, warehouses and jobs. And so, yeah. Uh, those uh, those places were uh, basically the part of St. Johnsbury that uh, most people wouldn't see, let's say. Another question is from Toon. Uh, how accurate was Daryl's dialogue in the beginning of the film when he was talking to Mark? Um, it was totally spontaneous, 100%. Not one thing said, just we were kind of talked about the scene, he's going to come out, and then we just did it. It was, it was a totally spontaneous. Could you talk about the all of the curse words and you know that part of it? Oh. I don't know if we talked about that, but we may have mentioned something about it. I really don't remember that kind of detail in, in terms of the I, question. I actually remember you asking me. You know, we're oh, talking. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you, yeah, that. So for sure, there was just chat, sort of checking in with this uh, guy called the director, Mr. Shalom, and and we all said, look, oh, just take it for wherever it's going to go, and if we feel the need, uh, you, you can edit it out. But we never got to that point. But you said that that's the way y'all talk. Yeah. To each other. Yeah. Well, that's key. The key is that's, I mean, you know, you go into that world and the F word is very uh, noticeable, shall I say. <laughs> and other way, you know, and other words and implications. Okay, yep. uh, the next question is from Susan. How did you come, come up with the happy ending? I was surprised to see Daryl died so peacefully where other endings were other endings considered? No, nothing was really, there wasn't anything. I mean, I can say this is a blanket statement and I'm sure Shalom will agree with me. Everything was done spontaneously in the moment. I mean, we may have talked about the nature of the scene, but uh, what happened during the scene became uh, free territory. Is that accurate? Well, I, I noticed that Julia, who is actually in real life a death doula, someone who sits with people as they're dying, she's uh, one of the attendees. And so 
she was coming from like deep experience and you know a very compassionate uh, place and uh i think she gave you know an amazing performance but again that's who she is with the twist that he wasn't really dying but the, you know i did direct that scene a bit more than i did a lot of the others because i wanted daryl to confess to do the final confession that all of he never really does his final a, a full confession until the death scene and so susan and other people who might be interested in that you know that's why he kind of dies peacefully is that he finally got that kind of last demon out of himself um, by confessing it you know it was released and he had a more peaceful death also you know julia's presence and singing you know the mary uh, prayer and doing all of the other things that she did were so uh you know magical and peaceful and i hope you know that someone like her could be with me <laughs> so uh it's really that's why i think it you know if it looked peaceful i think that's why okay um this question is from anonymous how was it working with former incarcerated population in St. John's Ferry? I guess that would be for you, Daryl. Well, actually, it's for both of us. Um, this, I don't know how to explain it. It's just not noticeable. That's just another person without uh, labeling anything with it or feeling anything about it as much as Here's a person we know, and this is a person that's, uh, you know, in the scene. Or uh, so, from my point of view, as as an actor, being close with the people it has no has no ultimate meaning other than it fits what we're, you know, speaking to in in the movie. Yeah, I mean, I I just. Uh, well, I trusted Daryl, and you know, as I met each, and I'd heard stories about all of them, and you know, as I met them, uh, I had a lot of like uh, concerns, let's say, and uh, but you know, they they were all like you know very sincere, and they really they wanted to be part of it. They kind of believed in the film. They loved Daryl, and you know, uh, follow him alone but um i think you know that they saw that we were giving them respect and uh they they like that and they deserve that you know i hope that it helped them in, in some ways and even eddie who's you know a great guy um you know it was very uplifting, I think, for him to be uh, recognized and to be part of it. And he really did a great job. Oh, it's amazing. So, um, this question is from Rachel. Talk a little bit more about your collaborative process. I know you partially answered that, but she wants you to talk a little bit more about it. <laughs> um, well, I think, okay, you know, we developed an arc for the plot, you know, so it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, you know, we sort of saw the top point and then we saw how it was going to decline towards his death. And, you know, we set that up quickly and that's what happens. So, and then we looked at each sort of episode along the way and tried to come up with, you know, simple ways of telling the story using a few characters um, where we could, you know, develop these uh, improvisational kind of games, you might call them, that are used often in theater. And um, then let's see what happens. And then there's a little directing in the location, but um, you know, so a lot of our, for me, a lot of our talk was, well, you know, we're working with so-and-so and that person needs 
to have this kind of direction. So let's think of like what the best inspirations are, you know, for that character to do what we need them to do. Not necessarily telling them directly what, well, no, we did tell them what they needed to do. <clears throat> we, we just didn't know exactly how it was gonna turn out. Cheryl? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, I mean, there's a, a certain amount, obviously, it's just, it's not all fluidly open and spacious there. You have to have, this is what we're trying to do in this scene and have a sense of it so that you can go inside and borrow that part of yourself and bring it out. Um, that, I think that showed up for me watching this. I haven't seen it in a while. And this is the latest version. The scene with Rachel actually spoke to that, I think, quite well. Uh, uh, from looking at both of us sitting on the bench uh, in particular. It really um, had a power to it relative to a sort of um, grasping of this amazing truth of murder. Um, so that's another way to look at that, I think. It yeah. goes along with what Shalom was saying. <clears throat> The next question is from Kathy. When did you start filming this? How long did it take from start to finish? Oh, well, it was very quick. <laughs> I think, you know, we started maybe in the beginning of the summer to actually seriously talk about it, maybe in July. I don't remember, maybe Rachel would remember actually. But, um, and then, you know, we shot a little bit every week. Um, I think by the end of August, I probably had started editing. And we yeah. thought about a few more scenes that we didn't shoot. And um, we kind of shot in order, more or less, mm -hmm. to keep that art uh, going. <clears throat> and um, like, I have to uh, acknowledge that uh, like um but julia is my uh daughter in love i guess you we call it <laughs> and uh so she happened to be visiting from north carolina and so i thought okay we have a death scene she's a, does this you know kind of professionally out of love um uh, and so there she was and then the you know an amazing scene at the end. And, uh, that's how well, the, the other thing that came to me is there was never any tension ever, ever in any of the shooting, any of the scene, and ever. It was always everybody was relaxed and there wasn't much to say. There wasn't a lot of talking and, you know, all of that. It was, here's what we're going to do. Let's see what happens. Do it. And, um, no egos whatsoever. <laughs> okay, the next question is from Valerie. Hi, Daryl. Nice work. Was it <laughs> difficult to watch yourself die in the film? And what are your plans for the film? Any entries into competitions? Well, that would be uh, Shalom's uh, question. My uh, answer uh, is that. Um, uh, the death scene was wonderful and soft and real. Given I'm 77 years old, I'm right on the edge of the curve. <laughs> you know, I thought it was, you know, amazingly brave, hard for me just as a camera person, uh, just not be like emotional, to get very emotional. And, uh, so um, I thought it was a pretty you know, amazingly active. <clears throat> uh, and Sarah wants to know, uh, one thing that surprised me is that he never really apologized. Maybe I missed it. He asked for forgiveness and owned his behavior and choices but I didn't really hear him say, I wish I had made a different choice. That surprised mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. 
Sarah. That's a very good question. I wonder who that Sarah was. <laughs> Any case, um, it just, uh, it, it, uh, how would I say it? It never came because um, it just didn't feel like that was what the character would say, quite frankly, that everything he showed, everything he demonstrated, everything he spoke to was always about that. It didn't have to be A plus B equals C. It was just organically a part of the scenery floating at some times and other times not so much. But clearly the whole thing is, uh, uh, doesn't need to be rubber stamped. That would be my answer. This is from Anonymous. Um, I just wanna, I forgot uh, the question before this. Uh, well, first, I, we knew uh, from Edward, even during the summer that this uh, might happen, something like this around the pole might happen. So we decided to really put off trying to get it screened other places until the Ramapo event would be like the premiere. And, uh, but I have sent it, started sending it to uh, festivals and, you know, we're especially want to kind of target some of the population, like especially returning citizens um, to, um, to see how they react to a film like this about forgiveness. I think maybe, you know, that's the, the key word that Daryl keeps saying, forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. I don't know. Yeah, I think Sarah is asking a really good question. I have to think about that, but everyone like forgives him. You know, he, the apology maybe isn't like a direct apology, but it comes through the way he confesses. And you know, goes you know to those really painful things, and they see in him the apology, and they forgive him. So I don't know if, if that you know maybe gets a little if that you know helps to answer that question, but it's something to think about for sure. <clears throat> uh, this question is from anonymous uh, again. Did you <laughs> see? the main character as a reflection of yourself or someone you know or something else? Um, I would say um, there, there is a lot of reflection of myself in that character, uh, not, not the murderer part, but um, you know, uh, there's a, for me, uh, experiencing the character as he's moving through this process is that he's very aware and uh, very in touch and uh, as a result is able to flow, ebb and flow, uh, be present, uh, and even in some uh, really having a kindness about him. A, a kindness, he's kind to himself over and over. He speaks to that in this, and I'm just thinking of that now to be candid with you, but he's, he's pretty damn kind to himself as he, as he goes through this amazing journey of death, knowing he's going to be dead in two months. And there he is, and he dies this amazing death, not prepared at all for what did happen with this wonderful woman praying for him and having the great pillows and uh, the Dalai Lama lying on his chest as a Buddhist, what a wonderful thing. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's my response. It's just flowed and he was flowing through this um, crazily, almost magical place. I believe this question is for Joey and Shalom. Uh, I just want to ask, okay. her, I just want to say that, like in a way, Daryl, the character that Daryl played and Tamar, the social worker, talks about what like a model citizen he was. In some way, he used uh, being in prison in terms of the story, almost like as being a monk in exactly. a meditation uh, place. 
So he came out of prison, like through his own, he found his silence. He found a place in himself that he holds on to very tight as a character. And uh, I think he, uh, I've sort of lost my track, but I, um, I think that that's a big part of the, uh, you know, again, what we're trying to convey, you know, that someone can come out of prison and sort of be almost like a, a guru or master in some way to have like a pure vision in some way towards his death and accepting of his death and still being able to do those confessions that um, I think, you know, would, would have been very brave if it was in any case. So I just, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, this question I believe is for Joe and Shalom is, uh, how did you achieve the animations in the opening sequence? Um, so Shalom uh, reached out to me and he said, I want to make a opening animation. And, he, you know, we, we were kind of going back and forth with ideas and ultimately we settled on this idea of making um, it about Daryl kind of coming out of prison and then drawing a connection between the plot of the story and the Icarus myth, which is why he then, you know, grows wings and flies up into the sky. And um, so to actually on a technical level achieve that, um, I used Photoshop to do most of the frame by frame animation. And then everything is pieced together in After Effects. Um, to, and then there's some animation that was done in After Effects as well. Um, and then I, you know, just kind of worked back and forth with Shalom. You know, I started with storyboarding it and um, we came to a consensus on how it should go, finding music to time it out with. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Shalom. But... Exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, again, like Daryl was saying, this is another case of just working kind of in harmony. When I sent you the music, you said, that's just what I imagined, I remember. And yeah, so it was just, it's always been great working with you and easy working with you. Like, I feel like we're uh, on, someone on the same wavelength as in the way that we communicate or stumble to communicate. <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay the last and final question and by the way there were some congratulate congratulationary uh sentences that i didn't use from uh, for instance one from daryl's nephew and some other people but i thought the questions would be more important the final question is from rick it reads uh what was the significance of the people in the pictures when daryl passed <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that right off the bat. Shalom. Me. Oh, I mean, there are two pictures. Oh, one, yeah. Well, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. One is uh, a, yeah. is Fatima, who is like um, she's one of the saints, and she represents compassion. You know, the big heart. Usually, and the other one is the Dalai Lama, who's you know he says his religion is practicing kindness and you know so those were cards that i happen to have you know in our space where we shot that and daryl had the idea of uh doing it in black and white like a bergman film or something that, but uh those those two uh images you know for him i and he could talk about the christian and the buddhist uh, parts of himself, um, you know, but for me, it was that these are uh, symbols of compassion. Well, I was raised as a Catholic, and I've been a practicing meditator and Buddhist for, believe it or not, 50 years. 
Um, so all the, that was resonation in a A plus way, those two things. That's great. Well, we're going to stop there, fellas. We've had a lot of questions. I can't even begin to thank you enough. Um, Daryl Rudy, Shalom Gorowitz, Joey Perez, thank you all for being with us this evening, being so generous with your time for this conversation. And a special thanks to you, Shalom and Daryl, for letting us screen your film, Days of Atonement. Um, it's been a lot of fun to work with you on this. And um, every week I forget to do this. So I'm, tonight I'm remembering. So I wanna say a special thanks to my team. It takes a lot of people behind the scenes to get us here tonight. So thank you to get to see Edward Eloy tonight, uh, Carly Berrios and Allie Pullen Clark, and to our Dean, Peter Campbell, and Provost Susan Galden for all of the support with this series. We have one more exciting week of a faculty film series next Tuesday, February 23rd at seven o'clock. I hope you'll join me as we screen Neil Scott's Blue Hole. If you haven't registered yet, it's the same process. Please go to our website at www dot ramapo backslash, uh, I'm sorry, ramapo.edu backslash Barry Center. And you'll be able to read up on that film and register to get the link next Tuesday at 7 p.m. So thank you all. Thank you for being with us this evening and everybody have a good night. Thanks for coming everybody. Yes, thank you very, very much.